science just gives you information, but it's humans who take that information and do something with it. Science is fun. Science is exciting. Science allows you to dream. My dream is a very simple dream. My dream is to make my patients' lives and their loved ones much better. All the best science in the world happens in either a coffee shop or a bar. <laughs> and it all happens on a napkin or a paper towel with a little pen and coffee cup rings or beer mug rings because the best science happens when people are relaxed and thinking creatively. I'd probably do my best thinking out in the sun. I just get really comfortable out there. I'd probably do my best thinking probably in the shade, like under a tree where it's really quiet. I find that when I travel and I'm kind of alone, sitting on an airplane, I frequently do very good thinking. Another time for me is when I first wake up in the morning before I get out of bed. So it's interesting that it's usually not when I'm sitting at my desk or in my lab, but usually when I'm outside of those places. I do my best thinking in my room, or my bed. I am a morning runner, and it's sort of my meditation time. It's my opportunity to be with my thoughts. Probably do my best thinking in the shower. Now that's my best thinking alone. It's quiet, it's warm, it's relaxed. Occasionally, there are also conversations with one or more other scientists or non-scientists where there's a great question or where there's a great insight. So it's the power of two. It's a combination of the people who inspire you and your own DNA to some extent. What got me interested in science was early on in my career when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. And I just decided one day that I wanted to have a little bit more in my science classes. And I went around looking for role models and I finally found a scientist who was a neuroscientist. And this person took me under their wing, that sort of mentorship that only comes with good friendship. And he allowed me to explore the world of science. He allowed me to think beyond my boundaries. He allowed me to go beyond the limits of my imagination. He always told me, only you put your own limits. You decide how far you want to take it, how far you want to go. I started in science because when I was a kid, I always liked to do puzzles and read mystery books and try to figure out the answer before the end. And I realized that by being a scientist, that's what I get to do. I just solve mysteries and do puzzles that are about the insides of our body. I also had a very pivotal moment in seventh grade where I had the most wonderful seventh grade science teacher, Mr. Matusik. And he made science so much fun. And the combination of he and my parents, I knew from seventh grade that I was going to go into genetics. When I was in high school, I loved science and math. And I got some summer fellowships from the American Heart Association and American Cancer Society to work in a, a university laboratory for the summer. And, um, you know, I caught the bug. It was the most exciting thing, actually, to be able to have a discussion or a dialogue with nature. You actually are talking and you're, you're, you're getting answers back. And how you get answers back is by doing experiments. You're actually qu asking questions by doing experiments. I always wonder how the world turned out the way it turned out instead of turning out a totally different way. And I wonder about things like how can all the biology in a cell work so perfectly to make us so complicated? How does a single cell become the very diverse whole individual? The most fascinating question, purely at the science level, this is not practical. If you take the one cell, how does that cell decide to split into two? How does that happen? How do stem cells decide to make all the different types of cells? And how can we manipulate that for good? Why is this person getting sick and this person isn't? Why are some cancers very aggressive and take somebody's life early? And why are other things something somebody can live with perhaps their entire lifespan? Why did this therapy work so nicely in Mr. Smith, and it didn't work so well in Mr. Jones. These questions, you know, it's uh, very much still the nature-nurture kind of thing that how much of this is the, the genes that you inherited and how much of it is due to your environment. 
um, how much of it is an interaction um, particular to both. Sometimes I wonder how come with such incredibly simple components like DNA and RNA and proteins, we can get to be such amazing creatures. If every person were able to have their genome sequenced, what would it mean? What's the point? What can philosophers and neuroscientists teach each other about free will and moral responsibility and the role that the brain plays in that? I tell my children, I tell my students, I tell my colleagues that you never know an answer until you do an experiment. And that's why it's science, and that's why science is so exciting, because also every experiment that you do, you find information. It's a new horizon. You're exploring the new horizon. How does this work? What's going to happen next? The way we portray science, the way we talk to our kids, plays an important role in what their fate is going to be. I think science is specifically is a, is a subject that allows you to really not have any boundaries, where there, is, there are no limits, that where your imagination is really your limit. You can do anything. If, you're, if you can feel it and your brain can imagine it, it's going to happen and you can do it. So I always encourage them to go beyond what they think is possible. And that through science and through our understanding of science, you can actually achieve great things for humanity. And you can be the best you can possibly be, the best human being you can be.